Thank you very much. Um, let me start by sharing my slides and thanking Elisa, Samueli, Valentine for this amazing workshop. It's such uh, like work for you. And I'm really happy to have the three of you as friends also and uh, do doing that because it's just amazing how much work you have to put on that. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. I will share my slides with you. And uh, as I said, you have to be patient with me. I am not a technology friendly person, but I think I can, um, let's see. So you're not still full screen. I want to not see myself. <laughs> okay. So now um, you should be seeing uh, my slides in full screen. And if you're not, please uh, let me know if something goes wrong. And also if I'm going beyond time, please interrupt me, okay? So as Maria told uh, you, I will be speaking about locally recoverable codes on surfaces. And this is based on joint work with two friends, with two people, um, I think Felipe is here. So he can deal with the ch chat maybe. <laughs> and, but please interrupt me if you have questions, of course. Um, I might be looking just a little down because I'm using three things at the same time. And, but let me tell you what I'm going to be doing over the next 40 or so minutes. Um, I mean, I'm very lucky that uh, we had yesterday a wonderful session. And we have, I mean, yeah, Beth, Joachim, Maria, Luciani speaking about codes to you. So if you didn't know about them, I think now you know a lot. And, but still, I had my slides ready since uh, a couple of days. And this means that I will go once more, speak a little bit about the basics. And um, well, if you know all, you can just switch off for the first five to 10 minutes, and then we get to some nice new stuff. I will then go over some known constructions that also one of them came up yesterday and it's quite basic and well known. But then finally on the last bit of this talk, I want to tell you about uh, what we did and just a little disclaimer maybe I should tell you, I don't have any proof in this talk. I have a lot of uh, like vision of what is happening, but I thought that uh, it wouldn't fit to do any very detailed proof, but I want to give you the flavor of what uh, we came up with. So this is the three of us having fun while the world was still okay. <laughs> and um, so maybe I also should say a few words about how this uh, project started. Um, at least for me, I started to care about codes uh, 10 years ago. In AGCT, um, I don't know if it was AGCT 13, which was in 2011. And as a postdoc, I was there pregnant <laughs> and uh, trying to do as much math as I could before I would yeah, become a mom. And um, I saw this talk about codes on surfaces. I think he was talking about codes on the peso surfaces. And I had been thinking about the peso surfaces for a long time at that point. And I just felt that I could follow the whole talk. It was about codes, which was something I had never thought about, but I realized that I could follow the whole talk about codes. And this is pretty neat. I felt quite happy about that. It's not always that we can follow something, right? The whole thing, at least not for me. <laughs> and I felt motivated to look into that. And of course, this became a little bit of a little hobby in the beginning because I was having kids, I had one kid at this point, then another one came one year and a half later, and then just I lost track of thinking about that. I was doing uh, other mathematics, but then I met Filippi um, uh, a couple of years later, around, I think uh, we started thinking about codes together as the three of us around 2015. And um, we thought about some very nice stuff, but one of them became, this paper and I'm going to be talking about it today. So this is just a little fun history about it because I find it's pretty nice that it started for me in such a nice workshop. So I, I feel it's cool to share with you. So the setup. Setup is just the same as yesterday. So if you saw the talks yesterday, you're good. 
Um, I have a prime power Q throughout the stalk and an error correcting code. I'm talking about the linear ones that came up already yesterday in the first talk. Um, and they're gonna be then linear subspaces of FQ to the N. And this is the set of words that we want to be dealing with. Uh, the length of the code, I'm gonna be denoting as usual by N. The dimension is K, which is really the block sizes, right? That I want to pass. And uh, I mean, I have the distance, which is the minimum humming weight of my words as usual. And such a code can correct D minus one over two mistakes and deal with uh, D minus one, uh, yeah, I mean, deletions that might happen in my symbols. So I, as a, I mean, I really like to see things, right, as a geometer. And um, I think it's helpful to have a picture of that. And so we have our point in FQ to the N, which of course doesn't need to be, uh, yeah, something that lies in our code, in our subvector space, but uh, we have our red points, which are the code words. So that I'm denoting here that I'm having the red to, to have them for you. And then I told you the minimal distance is D. So the smallest one you can see in the screen, you see here, this is a, the D. And um, well, the natural thing is to take the balls, right? Um, they will have radius D over two. And then this is why we can really correct D minus one over two. But yeah, like mistakes that can happen in our code and uh, deal with the D minus one failures. So this is a code word. And we have our little balls that lie in each code word as a center. And of course, that when you transmit the message, you suppose, and that's really the norm, right? That mistakes happen and they do. And uh, therefore I don't get a red word, but I had something blue, which is something that I get, but it's not a proper code word. And what I do, well, I go over the little ball of radius D minus one over two with center in that thing that I got and I recover the closest co code word. So that's how I started to think about codes as thing then I think it helps at least people who are starting. Okay, so that's what is happening. And uh, of course, what we want in the end of the day is uh, from all that I told you and from yesterday's talks, it became clear that we want to have codes that have large D so that you can detect and deal with a lot of mistakes that can happen while you send your message. But uh, of course, you don't want to add too much redundancy to it. So you want this difference, right? Uh, uh, from the number, uh, sorry, let me write, uh, n minus k to be small. And um, this is something that it's somehow there is some pr price to pay to get that. And this is encoded in the single tau bound, which essentially tells you that you cannot have all. You have to give in into something, right? And that is also something that appeared yesterday. And uh, so I'm not gonna go over discussing the single tau bound too much, which is something that's been there for a while. And um, as Beth put it very nicely, um, when we are dealing with, um, maybe like distributed storage systems, big data nowadays, which is something that is quite present in our lives. We want to be able to deal with failures, right? In our nodes. And we want to do this without having, for instance, to go over the whole like symbols. And that's what motivated the, um, uh, I mean, the definition of locally recoverable codes, which is something that came much, much later, right? This came around 2012. And this was introduced by this guy. So I think, oh, sorry, I forgot just to mention that, uh, well, this is a name that came up yesterday a lot, the um, maximum distance separable codes, which are the ones that satisfy this inequality with an equality symbol, okay? So those are the uh, MDS codes. And uh, unfortunately, these are typically short. And uh, well, we, I mean, do think that they will normally have lengths uh, comparable at most to the size of the field you are working on. So you don't get long maximal distance separable codes usually. 
And I was jumping a little bit because I didn't look at my slides. <laughs> and uh, so as Beth introduced yesterday, there are these new kinds of codes which are called locally recoverable codes, which allow you to not have to go over. So if you send some message with a normal code and there was something that went wrong, normally to get over what is missing or what is wrong, you have to go over the whole world. Yeah, like the whole, uh, yeah, like, sorry, you have to go over K symbols of the word. And that's what is behind this definition, right? And it turns out that when you're dealing with big data, this costs a lot of traffic in your system and you don't want to go over K symbols. You want maybe to go uh, over less than K symbols. And um, this is what motivated the definition then of this code, which are called locally recoverable codes. And um, this was already something that appeared. So let's recall that uh, a code will have locality R if I can reconstruct its symbols by looking at a, um, at a set of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, some bug in my tablet. If I can look at a, a less than K, and this is gonna be uh, this uh, R symbols in my code word. And this set of R symbols is called uh, the recovery set. Is there a question in the chat? Sorry, I was just wondering if you were trying to write because I can't see the notes. Yeah, no, I tried and then my tablet froze and I stopped. So I'm not trying oh, okay. to write anymore. That's why I was a little okay. yeah, doubtful here while speaking, I'm sorry. So we were talking about locally recoverable codes and uh, I went over the definition once more and why do we care? I think I explained this to you. This helps us to deal um, with data, with big data, so with failures in distributed storage systems. And somehow, of course, one way to do that, uh, I think Beth mentioned yesterday, would be just to repeat, right? If your whole node burns for some reason and is on fire, there is an explosion, you have to be able to get back to the message. And normally what they would do in this, what was called a you know, RAID 1, was to repeat three times the message. And this was when they started to deal with this big data thing, they would just repeat it three times. And of course, this costs 200% to you, right? Yeah, like, right? And this was why they came up with this definition of locally recoverable codes is that you would be uh, able to deal with more failure than the repetition ones by paying much less of a price, okay? So that's why you should care about these codes. And, as in the other world before, uh, of course, uh, I mean, nowadays, since we introduced this new, uh, yeah, like parameter, I want it to be as small as possible. So I don't have to go over many symbols. I can recover whatever is lost by just looking at a few symbols. So the nice role, the dream role would be it has small locality, a large information rate. So you can transmit, you don't have to put a lot of, uh, mean a redundancy on your message and has a large minimal distance, of course, as I motivated before. And once again, there is a price to pay. You cannot have it all. So this is uh, encoded in a single to type bound, which didn't appear yesterday because she was dealing with uh, multiple recovery sets. So this was somehow still an inequality and uh, somehow conjecturally, yeah, right, that you would or would not get uh, an equality in the single to type bounds that appeared yesterday for locally recoverable codes, but for those that I'm gonna show here. So this is uh, something that was shown, as I said, as soon as they came up with these codes, uh, these people, I think they were at Microsoft Research at that time, or I might be mistaken, it might be Facebook. <laughs> um, they showed that uh, you have this kind of bound. And this is very nice because you see clearly, right, that. Uh, if you have a normal code, uh, which is not uh, supposedly locally recoverable, you just have R equal to K, and therefore you recover back your single to type bound, which is just how it should be. And um, as before, when you have an equality, you have an optimal locally recoverable code. And when they came up, uh, um, they, I mean, the lengths of the codes were 
was usually uh, very small in comparison to the size of the field. And then very soon they got locally recoverable codes, which were of, of lengths comparable to the field size. And this was all coming uh, yeah, very quickly around the time that they came up. And a natural question, of course, is whether you could uh, construct uh, locally recoverable codes uh, with, which are large, so which are no longer short. So I'm going to say that they are short if they have length comparable to the field size and large when this is bigger by some nice factor. And that's the goal of today somehow is to come up with constructions that give longer locally recoverable codes, just that uh, if you never thought about them, think that, that uh, of course you want this R to be as small as possible. And um, I'm gonna be talking about, um, yeah, how can you deal with small Rs somehow, but um, let me get to the goal of today. So we are gonna deal with this natural question and by no means I'm claiming that we are the first ones that dealt with this natural question that comes. There is a lot of work, this field, uh, I mean, it's a lot got, yeah, like that is going on. So don't, uh, if I'm not mentioning you, it's just because there are so many names and um, I do recognize that there is a lot of research nowadays. So today what we want to do is to use geometry, uh, more precisely, I want to be talking about surfaces to get long uh, locally recoverable codes. And many times they will be as nice as they can. Okay, that's the goal of today. And how I'm gonna do that? Well, so first we're gonna go over some known constructions and then I will um, go over geometric properties of curves, but also of surfaces. And uh, those are gonna be key to getting the parameters right. So the codes we construct, another disclaimer, they are actually, they could be seen as codes on maybe curves, but it's the surfaces, it's the fact that they lie inside of a surface that we can produce them there, that makes it much nicer, this uh, description of the locality and of the distance of these codes. So I will very briefly, because now you're all, uh, knowing a lot about codes, I will recall what's a Reed-Solomon code because that's the motivation for the construction that uh, we started looking at when we thought about locally recoverable codes. So um, as introduced yesterday, Reed-Solomon codes, they are evaluation codes. So this means that you are taking polynomials of some bounded degree. And so you have this k-dimensional vector space here and you evaluate these polynomials in uh, um, points in FQ, which are distinct with, of course, n bigger than k. So in green, you're seeing the polynomial. And uh, so you evaluate, you're seeing the points here. And the code message that you get just I mean will not have this f, will just be these points, right? And um, as uh, most of you know, those are uh, and the s codes, but short usually. And typically, so, I mean, I put one example here that I hope I did the parameters right. <laughs> and uh, so one example, you could take uh, n equals to 12. So you can work in F13, for instance, and already there you can get uh, something with transmission rate at 75%, right? And some distance, which is quite decent. Um, okay. And as I said, I want to talk about locally recoverable codes and the, what motivated us was a construction introduced in 2014 by Itzhak Tamo and Sasha Bark. And they came up with a systematic way to construct locally recoverable codes with any value of R, maybe, I mean, the ones that I'm gonna present here have some constraints on the R, but uh, that goes from one, right, to K, which is the maximum one, which we don't want to talk about anyways, because they were just the codes we had before, the Reed solomon ones. And they do that by generalizing the Reed solomon codes, but in a very clever way, in a very nice way. And so they are just Reed solomon codes, if you want, or maybe like a bombed version. Um, and uh, so what they do again, they're gonna take an evaluation code. So they take this 
vector spaces given by polynomials um, in F over FQ. But now the polynomials are a little special. And again, so you're seeing here uh, the polynomial in green and my points where I am going to take the values, right? I'm going to plug these points to the polynomial. And uh, the key thing is the way that the polynomial is constructed. So it's what you're seeing here in my pointer on the upper right side. And the key thing is that there is this small polynomial G encoded that is just inside the description of my polynomial F. So there is a smaller degree of polynomial relating these symbols. And um, so by doing that, I don't have to go uh, through the whole K symbols, but just to the ones that have the same G when I recover my work. So you just have to, I mean, uh, it's a very nice way. It's quite simple and that's why it's so be beautiful, right? And by doing that, so you get the recovery set, which is just gonna be the set of uh, guys that have, uh, I mean, that hit the same G. So here you have the recovery set, right? For each point here in this line, I can use the three points to recover uh, the value in this one here. So I don't have to go over all the guys that are in my green curve, in my green guy here, polynomial. I just have to look through this pink curve here. And this is beautiful, right? So, but again, that was a price to pay from the single to type bound. And the price becomes very clear when you compute a code with similar parameters as the one before. So this is, um, if I take again in, in F13, I could get a code with lens 12, dimension nine and locality three. So much better, right? So I don't have to go over the nine symbols of my code. I just have to look to three of them to recover one. So this is beautiful for data storage reasons. But the distance is much worse. And this is the price we are paying from the new single type bound. And again, these are very nice codes. They are as good as they can be. But again, they are short and uh, it's kind of clear why they're short, right? And uh, as also mentioned previously, um, both of these codes, uh, actually not both were mentioned previously, but at least the Reed Solomon codes, I mean, they are well known that we can see them as GAPA codes. So you can just take, uh, I mean, instead of taking something in the function field uh, or sorry, yeah, in the function field, if you want uh, of uh, A1 or of P1, you can take something in the function field of some curve. And this means you can be looking at human horse spaces of curves. And this has been done systematically in different flavors by many, many people. And the thing is that Tomo Bark codes can also uh, afford the same interpretation. And we were not the first ones to do this, even though we were thinking about it. Uh, together with Serge Vladutz, they came up with a very nice interpretation of these codes as curve codes. So they just replace, in, in, I mean, and by doing that, you do get longer codes um, that are very nice um, by taking here some human horse space in a curve. And this is quite neat. And again, just to make it clear that you got it, the local recovery, right, in the Tamo Barg Vladutz codes will come from, I mean, interpolating a univariate polynomial on our coordinates instead of K. So this is the better thing, right, of the code word. So that's what um, one gets. So what's the geometry? of this code. So before I get into introducing codes on varieties, let's just think about, um, I'm gonna revisit the last slides of Tamo and Bark and take R equals three, for instance. And um, you could get your code by taking, uh, I mean, um, yeah, every time four points in general position in the plane. This means that no three of them lie in a line. So, um, so for instance, they could lie in the like parabola of y equals x squared. And that's what was encoded in their little construction. I mean, in their yeah, like construction that you saw in the last slide. And uh, we can do that in a way that the value of uh, x that you take will correspond to the solutions of x4 equal to t. So you fix a value of t and you look at the solutions of that. And uh, 
the very nice thing is that I'm looking at four points. So if I know the value of this linear polynomial here in three points, I can recover the value in the fourth point. So that's the beauty of it. That's the local recovery coming up to play. And uh, well, the codes can be seen very nicely. So this map G, this uh, guy G polynomial that they had um, in the definition, you can just look at it as a uh, vibration, right? You can look at this as a map actually from A1 to A1 and actually use this to get some kind of ruling or some kind of like vibration in the like surface A1 cross A1. And that's what we are gonna be doing. That's the kind of view point that we want to do. So here you see they are on this fiber. So they, I mean, they are not on a line, okay? They, they, this is X, this is T, there's no Y here. So just that you don't get confused. I did realize when I was going over it, that it looks like they are on a line, but no, they are on a fiber, right? And this is the picture of the code that I had in the previous slide. So now I can recast uh, this, putting a little more language into it from algebraic geometry. And that's what I'm gonna be doing now. So maybe if you're not paying attention, that's a good point to start paying attention maybe. Um, I'm gonna recast then the Tamo Bark codes uh, the thermal bar Vladut's codes, uh, if you want, as algebraic geometry codes. And the language that we are going to introduce, so I'm going to have X, a quasi-projective variety over FQ, and I'm going to be taking a set of rational points in X, and V uh, is a finite dimensional vector space over, I mean, that is, um, I mean, that lies inside of the function field of this variety X. And typically what we want is to take V, um, in the space of sections of some line bundle. So think about the curves, you're taking it in some kind of human horse space. And um, the code is just gonna be the image, just as in the case of curves, of this evaluation map. So again, it's an evaluation code as it should be, right? That's what we're talking about. And the length of such code, again, this is gonna be denoted by N, the way that we construct it. The dimension, well, the dimension is the dimension of this vector space minus the dimension of the kernel. And if we are lucky or if we do things nicely, this might even be an injective map. So the dimension is just the dimension of V. And the distance, so what's the distance? Recall, the distance is the minimal humming weight. So the distance is gonna be the minimal uh, of the set of uh, P's such that FP, right, uh, is not zero. So it's the minimum numbers um, of non-zero coordinates when I evaluate. So again, a picture is worth more than a thousand words and let's try to understand Tamo Bark pictorially. And um, that's, I mean, what we are gonna do in the end of the world, I mean, in the end of the day, not of the world, <laughs> is to, um, I mean, interpret all these manipulations that go in their code, all the smart constructions, right? The fact that we have this G and so on, in the language of surfaces and of varieties. And uh, then we are gonna strip the code from everything that we don't need that makes it be uh, like short in order to make it long. So we put it in the most like general setting that we can afford. Then we get rid of whatever is not serving us and then we construct long codes. So that's um, the, what we really want to do. So here, as I said, above some T, I'm gonna take some like polynomial G and on the fibers, right? Uh, I have all the guys such that the XIs have the same G, right? I have R plus one points in a fiber and I'm doing what, I mean, what they do is that they pick B values of T. Normally they do some kind of nice partition of FQ star such that uh, you can take these B values and then uh, you have B times R plus one is gonna be the length of your code. So here I have my points denoted here. I'm taking the X and the T's. And these points are such that uh, all X map to the same T by G. And uh, the way that they construct the codes, they have this somehow, I mean, what is encoded there, right? Is that they are taking these um, values of, uh, um, I mean, I don't have the polynomial written here anymore the big thing in the vector space. But uh, if you remember it, you have these values, these powers 
of your uh, ex guy uh, appearing it. And it's the presence of these powers in the polynomial that they work with that uh, let us uh, embed these points here in this higher dimensional space of in this, uh, I mean, yeah, a r minus one times a one uh, in a way that these points don't lie. I mean, that r of these points don't lie on a hyperplane. And um, they do this, right, by having, I mean, yeah, let me just say in my words, what they do is that by choosing this X like that, these points lie on a rational normal curve in AR, yeah, in AR. So um, that's what they are doing in the end of the day, but uh, I will go over this construction, maybe also comparing with their language, their recovery for it. And um, by doing that, when we go to this higher dimensional space, our fiber, right, the points that lies on this fiber T, they are lined up nicely in a rational normal curve. So as I said, this means that no R of them are in a hyperplane and that's the local recovery plane. That's what's gonna let us uh, recover back our symbols that were lost eventually. So um, I think now we can go over the parameters of the code. So as I said, um, they take B fibers, right? I have B values of T and above each I have R plus one point. So my length is gonna be B times R plus one. Um, I have my space of functions, the space that they take is that one here. So here you're seeing that these powers of X, right? X zero, X, X two, X three, until X to the R. And um, the dimension of this vector space is clearly uh, R plus one times uh, N plus one, right? Uh, by the way that I choose these polynomials here, N is bounded the degree of the AIs. And then my code is this uh, evaluation thing here at these points that I chose. And this is a linear subspace of F Q to the N. And this was done with uh, Fortamo and Barg uh, with a function G of X um, that is giving me the fiber being x r plus one, but they actually also speak about other g's later, and especially when they're dealing uh, with the generalization with Vladus. Okay, so what is the locality? So how do they get the locality? So the locality, remember, it was this, I mean, interpolation, right, uh, of uh, the polynomial g in R values, G was something of degree R plus one, and I interpolated it in R values to reconstruct the missing symbol. And um, the key point, as I said, is the fact that no, like, uh, yeah, R of these points lie on a hyperplane. So here I'm repeating myself, but this means that when I try to recover, I'm gonna solve this linear system. But if you look closely, you're seeing that this linear system, I mean, that this matrix here is a van der Mond matrix. So this is a very nice invertible matrix that every student loves when they meet. And so we also love it. And being a van der Mond, yeah, like matrix, uh, oh, sorry, it went too fast. This means that, uh, we can deal with it very nicely and then get the recoverability that we wanted. So what about the distance of these codes? As I said, these codes are as good as they can be. They satisfy the single to type bound. And uh, in order to see that, the like explanation is very simple. Well, you have that the value of F at the, uh, I mean, um, this X, I, J's here, right? I'm looking this, I mean, F of some Pij is just this polynomial evaluated at some Xij. And this is a polynomial of degree at most n times r plus one plus r minus one. So as I said, the distance is the minimum humming weight and therefore the distance is gonna be, a, well, my uh, n minus the number of zeros that this polynomial can have, which is at most n times r plus one plus r minus one. So this is telling me that the distance is somehow bounded right uh, from below by this quantity um, because that's the maximum number of zeros that I have. But on the other hand, when I look at the single to type bound that I introduced previously, you see that uh, putting here, right, uh, n, k, k over r and one, 
I am sorry, and two, I get back this, which is precisely that. So this means that these two things match and therefore I do have optimal locally recoverable code. So I get to the point where I can tell you a little bit about how would we do to get longer codes. And that's our goal for this last um, part of the talk. So I wanted to get longer codes. And as I, I mean, it became clear from the construction, this case, I mean, these codes are short and this is kind of, I'm not even gonna, I mean, for the sake of time, explain what's more this. Um, so the way that we construct it is clearly bounding um, the length of these codes. And the problem is that this G that we use to construct, right, is in our way. The G is the savior because it is precisely what allows you to get this nice locality. But this is also somehow making us have issues because we are constructing this with this G. And in order to have this making sense, we have to partition FQ in B sets of cardinality R plus one. And uh, so we have to get rid of this. And that's how we are going to do. So to get longer codes, we forget G. And, but of course, I introduced a lot of structures, so we are going to keep this geometric structure that this kind of construction can afford. But uh, let's see what we can do without the G. So just by, I mean, I would like to share with you that by forgetting the G and keeping some structure, that's what in our paper we called baseline codes. And we already get some very nice long codes with a decent distance and a very nice transmission rate. So already, we get uh, something which is pretty nice. And this is no dramatic extra structure other than essentially what I introduced it to you. And then we forget G and do um, a little like looking at what's happening in these root surfaces. So now um, let's forget G. So in our paper, we forgot G in two ways. Uh, in two essential ways. And I believe one can keep forgetting in many ways as long as you know um, how to explore the surface you're working with, exploit, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, so one way that we did this was keeping the construction that I just explained to you on a root surface. And then um, as we saw, we embed this on a higher dimensional space and it's this embedding that allows us to see the points of uh, the fibers on a rational normal curve. And this allows us to get the locality. And the second way one can do this, and this is the way that all of us, the three of us, I mean, like, and I think we, we tried um, to get something nice is to replace this uh, idea of a rule surface by any other surface, but one that is quite, I mean, that is quite cherished, at least by me, but also by the, two of them, uh, which is a surface with a genus one vibration to some basis. So it became clear to you, right? I hope that all that we needed was to have some kind of vibration to some cu curve. And uh, therefore uh, these surfaces are the perfect, I mean, like the perfect setting, the perfect, uh, I mean, a candidates to do that. And then what you do, well, moreover, they have this gr group law on the fibers and you explore that to get locality of your code. And that's something that we also did and you should have a look at the paper if you care for these things, elliptic surfaces in particular. So as I told you, today we are gonna focus on one point in the interest of time and that's gonna be the first one because I already <laughs> introduced this construction to you. So let's forget G and keep the root surface viewpoint. So when we forget G, again, I want to take B fibers. So I take B values of T and R plus one points above each T. So the length is going to be as before. I'm doing B times R plus one, but I don't have, again, to choose this like points in a way that I'm bounding the size of the code so far. Okay. Uh, the space of functions is I'm keeping the structure. So I have the same space for point uh, evaluation that is going to let us construct our code words. This is, of course, a vector space over FQ. And the dimension of this code is as before. It's R plus one times N plus one. And I do like that. And so we have a code looking something like that. How you, would you compute the distance with this structure? So I gave you points. These points lies on, lie on fibers. And I constructed my code. How do I want to compute the distance? So again, recall, sorry, I didn't want to show you all that, but the distance is the number of no zero, right? So I want this F 
uh, not to, I mean, not to vanish too much in these PIs and uh, well, recall what the PIs were. And the, uh, so here in blue, you have F, okay? So this is F and the idea then to get this um, as small, sorry, as large as possible uh, and therefore to get as few, right? Uh, zero values for the F as possible as well, go, Thread some curve, um, sorry, over all the code points. So um, I'm going backwards, right? I'm first considering the points and then threading the curve. Of course, that in practice, you first um, consider the curve and then you look at points in your curve. But uh, we do this in a way that you, I mean, that we minimize this value here. And that's precisely giving me a large minimal distance because the minimal distance is the number of non-zero entries here. So our goal is to do this in a way that we can minimize this uh, intersection. So as geometers, when we think about intersection of curves, um, of course, this is full of intuition, right? Uh, I think for us. And um, one thing that one knows, right, is that uh, if you would work in the projective plane, as um, well, this I mean, intersection number would depend solely on the degree of these curves of this polynomial f equals zero and of this curve c. And this is fixed. <laughs> of course, this is terrible because I want to have something minimal. I want to make it as small as possible. And therefore, I'm not working in a projective space. I'm working on a quasi projective variety. It's just because I really don't want to include these points in my. Code. So I don't want to have this fixed within, I mean, when I construct my code. So because this don't change when I vary um, this F in the vector space, right? So this is pretty ba bad. And uh, therefore, the first thing I do is that I don't want to work in the projective plane, but well, I mean, I do want to minimize this quantity. And the best way to do that is actually to explore the boundary right uh, of uh, the spaces that we are working on and that's why you, you saw a one cross a one and not i mean and i didn't use a a two so that's why we we construct our codes in fir like first we are looking a one cross a one rather than in a two is just to make clear that uh, the correct compactification right so this is the same thing but the correct compactification is going to be P1 cross P1 rather than P2. So that's why we really, and that's why I shouldn't do all my slides because that's the dirt I do to them. So um, that's what we are going to do in the last five minutes or less of this talk. So the key is to throw all these intersections of this of these curves, I mean, I'm varying F, right? But C is fixed. And I throw those intersections to the boundary. And uh, if I do this in a way that they meet with high multiplicity, everything else, if I look at my code words, they are not there. So this boundary is not a code word. So it's not something that I'm uh, looking at. So sorry, it's not something where I am going to take uh, the functions f to evaluate them. And uh, therefore, my points are those in small red and not large red. And since that this, I mean, this meeting of the blue and the black is fixed, if they meet a lot here, they cannot meet a lot down there. And that's the key uh, uh, thing in our codes. And now I comes the busiest slide of this talk. So don't be afraid. I'm going to share the slides with you and also this you find in the paper. So don't try to dig into everything, but the kind of theorem that we have. So we take the, I mean, this curve here. So you have this cyclic cover of uh, A1 over the T line, right? Over A1T. And um, by putting the parameters nicely, so by constructing this space with the correct degrees of the AIs, we managed to get a code. Well, the lens. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this, how big we can go soon in one example. So that's the kind of length we get. Uh, um, the dimensions, well, this is gonna vary by the way that we construct and by looking at this curve. And uh, well, the distance, well, is smaller than this big thing here. 
and larger than well this here so this is the single toe bound right is as good as it could be and this is coming from the intersection of uh, the curve c and uh, the f equal to zero and so when do we get a nice call so the, this seems to be rather off right well we do get an optimal locally recoverable code for instance if we get this guy equal to one uh, or r equal to three so again by taking r equals to three we already get some nicer code so some kind of generalization of the long code that i presented to you and this is an example so for instance by setting up this uh parameter equal to two and r equal to three. And then here I'm cheating because I didn't introduce this d before. So just believe me, this d is related to the n. I, I can explain more uh, maybe at some point uh, or during the break. So this d is can be picked in a way that we can use the theorem to show that we get a locally recoverable code that generalizes the one, the long one I showed to you before. And now because this b right, uh, is somehow the number of fibers that I take. This is bounded by the cardinality of the field. So, well, they are long, well, they are four times the cardinality of the field at most. And um, this means that we can construct codes with um, this land. So four times the field size, locality three, and a quite nice transmission rate. So I conclude with what else? Well, uh, in the paper we dealt with other Hilbert surfaces, just because, I mean, if you deal with P1 cross P1 and you work with varieties, of course, you want to know what's happening on those Hilbert sur surfaces. Um, and that's what we did. So we did uh, go over the constructions of uh, the codes, but using now this embedding in a Hilbert sur yeah, like surface, and, uh, but the parameters get a little worse. My time is over, right, Maria? Is that what you want to tell me? Yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, this is fine, I'm, please. I'm, yeah, I'm really concluding now. Yeah, yeah. So we please. have adapted the constructions to them, but we get slightly worse parameters. And why is that? So the point is that um, when you are working with human horse spaces, uh, so with spaces of sections of line bundles on the Hisabur surfaces, when um, you consider what we consider for P1 cross P1, so you produce something by taking the two generators of the Picard group and the multiples of them, uh, the higher the M, the smaller is the dimension of the vector space that you have when you compare with the same vector space that you would get for uh, P1 cross P1. So smaller dimension when you look at the singleton type bound means worse distance means worse parameters somehow. And uh, elliptic surfaces, as I said, we, we did a lot of nice things and I didn't talk about them. But for instance, we showed that uh, for every uh, odd prime power and the integer D, which is bounded in a neat way, we could construct locally recoverable codes with some decent lengths and nice dimension. And um, I think that's all I wanted to tell you. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Yeah. <laughs> now I can see you. So uh, we have 10 minutes for uh, questions. So I will ask you, are there any questions or comments for Cecilia? Should I stop sharing or I, I leave it for now, right? In case the questions are yeah, concerning. Yeah, it's a good stuff. idea. Yeah. So I can see that there is one question. I cannot see from who? From Elisa. Yeah. Please, Elisa. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> um, I have a question because, okay, if you got the idea right, the idea is that you have like these surfaces and the way in which you recover information is by looking at the at the first. And I was wondering what happened. So maybe you are avoiding this case because you are considering this surfaces but what happens if one of the fibers is singular does it give you some problems or is okay uh no so uh we don't look at singular fibers because so the, the thing is that we need the fibers um uh, to have the same number of po points to start mm -hmm. with so we are just constructing the curves on the smooth fibers and that's why well um the curve that we picked so if you go this is a nice question because allows me to go back to the 
hypothesis of the theorem, for instance, this curve is speaked in a way that we will get the best scenario because we have, I mean, if you put, sorry, I should have a hypothesis. So if, for instance, if in this curve, uh, in this cyclic cover, you take um, with, you take Q congruent. So you take R such that Q is congruent to one mod R plus one. In this case, you're going to get as many fibers which are smooth and we'll have R plus one points as possible. Mm -hmm. So we do want to, to play with that. We don't want to have uh, like singular. So we are on purpose not looking at singular fibers. Okay, this is what I was thinking. But then because you saw like, I mean, almost at the end, like this idea that you put that there are high multiplicity, like you work with the P1 instead of the A1. So you put like the points with high multiplicity, like in the, at the point of the curve C, yeah. So you don't look at them. And I was thinking that maybe you can do the same thing, right? If you have a singularity in the fiber or you don't have that, not that many singularities, you can put them at the infinity and then you can get rid of them. I don't know. Ah. Huh. Yeah, I mean, yeah I think especially that's on the elliptic surface case, uh, right? Uh, but um, yeah, then still the, the nice thing of working with elliptic surface is that the fibers will have uh, more points, right? If you are lucky with the Hasse-Veil bound. And then if I have a singular fiber, I have a GM or a GA, and um, I want a lot of points. So Okay, yeah, I mean, yeah. I see now what is the problem that, I mean, you are really killing the number of points by getting some, okay, yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Cecilia. But thanks for the question, and it let me say this hypothesis, <laughs> which is something nice. Yes, um, I can see another hand by Samuele. Yes, uh, is indeed about the last mystery that I had, which is uh, about the parameter D, which appears in your theorem. So is that connected to Q and to R, I think, right? The size of the field and the local uh, the quality parameter. Uh, the, the D on the example or what? Uh, in, uh, yes, in the example that you had after and also here. Um, Sorry, in the theorem or, I mean, this, this, this D here, um, I mean, the thing is that we manipulate this N. So the D is related to the N. And uh, so we have this N, when, which is the dimension, right? Which is related to the degrees of the AIs. And then of course, uh, this, this N is determining this intersection, right? So that's why we have the N here, but the N is actually related to, to, to D. And um, I can write to you what it is. Um, let me just find a, a place <laughs> in the slide. <laughs> But uh, this n can be seen in the other example as I think n minus the d that we pick uh, over r plus one. So this is the yeah, like relation. So yes, you are picking it and um, the conditions that we put. So you see, we put a lot of conditions and this is uh, in order to have the correct locality. This four divides d and so on, right? Because the locality is three. So this means I want four points in each fiber. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. And uh, we have another question from uh, Elena. Um, hello. Uh, in the hello. case of the elliptic surface, you said that you use the group law for the recoverability. Where do you use the, the group law? Ah, uh, I mean, so the thing is that. Um, you have uh, your elliptic surface, right? Uh, so you're fibering over some curve B. And um, what I want is I, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do it in a way, maybe bad color. I'm gonna do it in a way that I have uh, R plus one points in the fiber. And if we pick things, if we pick the elliptic surface neatly and the model veil group, for instance, being finite that we can specialize in an injective way and the fibers having R plus one points, then um, you can do it in a way that, uh, so we fabricate this in a way that P1 times plus PR plus one in the group law of the fiber is equal to zero. So the fabrication is really of the code is like that. So if you look at the paper, we will have uh, I mean, um, yeah, examples such that the model veil group is finite and uh, we produce one fiber that already 
satisfies this. And we have a lemma that shows that if you have one fiber that satisfies this, then all smooth fibers are also going to satisfy this model of some hypothesis. And therefore, you get your nice code. So this is, for instance, I can, um, I have, I cheat always. And I was preparing more talk, but then I know that I should only speak for 45 minutes. And I was deleting things. And um, I motivated on a talk that uh, Felipe gave about the team. I cheated some uh, examples of his talk. Ah, my email has changed everybody. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I mean, Elisa Gorla wrote to me yesterday saying it was impossible to write to me and that she spent some time to find my email. So it's here for you. I mean, yeah, now in the Netherlands since um, January, that's my email. And, um, but it will be on the slides and on the elliptic curve case. So for instance, by taking surfaces like that, um, we constructed, let me just go to the codes. I mean, we, we have functions that are like that and the kind of codes we get, for instance, I'm gonna tell you what A is and what B, which is the number of fibers that we take is, we get something, for instance, like that kind of code. So this was the deleted slides. And um, so, yeah, I hope I, I mean, I got to your question, which is, we force the model wheel group to be finite and uh, in a way that uh, the R plus one points add up to zero. And that's the it's kind of, yeah, the ch cheapest way to do this, right? Is it clear? You force the group to be finite? Yeah. Uh, is it? You, force you can ask which, more. Uh, you, you force which group to be finite, sorry? The model veil group of the generic fiber. Ah, okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, uh, I can see in the chat that there is a, a question from uh, Mathieu, maybe. No, no, but Mathieu is here, it's okay. Oh, it's you, pardon. Sorry. May I have a... Uh, Another question, since we are all here. Um, so I was wondering if you try also to uh, consider uh, fibered surfaces which are not the elliptic and the real one. So like when you have uh, the fibers, which is not of genus one, like genus two or genus three. So all the yeah, we didn't try. That's okay. a very good question. And I would be very interested in discussing with anybody who wants to think about that. I, I, I mean, I love to yeah, just talk and collaborate with people. It's what makes it all fun, right? And uh, so the thing is that I see a few problems, right? Uh, the nice thing on the elliptic surface, for instance, is this idea that uh, we have the group law on the fiber. Group law. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yes, yes. Of course, one could try to do something with vibrations in genus G curve and then take the Jacobian variety and then you have an abelian surface or an abelian, if it's genus two, or an abelian variety and then try to cook something with the group law there. But I would expect that in the end of the day, as usual, you would get something that it's a curve code. So therefore, you could have built this in another way without introducing the language of varieties. Mm. So maybe the message is that um, I mean, many of the codes uh, that we get, they actually, in the end of the day, they come back to the curve uh, like setting. But um, the nice thing, and it, it was worth it to introduce the geometry of surfaces and of higher dimensional like varieties, just because, not only because we can, we are not just narcissists trying to do the most beautiful mathematics we can, but also because it makes it nicer. It makes it really, it's like, yeah, like really got us to compute these parameters. So that's how we got there. With the abelian varieties, I, yeah, I really, I don't know, I, I cannot say much more now because I don't know what uh, oh, yeah. would be the intelligent way to do that, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. <laughs>